Hi, I'm Don Gooding with the Four Colors of Money for Entrepreneurs. In this session, we're going to talk about a risk reduction framework. Sounds like fun, right? So the reason to talk about a risk reduction framework is that investors talk that way. So you need to learn to speak the language of risk reduction. And secondly, I want to encourage you to think about risk reduction as a way to maximize your chance of being successful. Before we dig into the details, I want to make one simple point. Opportunities and risks go hand in hand. In fact, they are two sides of the same coin. Investors see it that way, and you should too. For now though, we're just going to focus on risks, and in particular, we're going to focus on trying to understand the investor's perspective by kind of reverse engineering how investors perceive risks. So first of all, investors, what are they trying to do? They're trying to deliver to their investors, the people they're getting the money from, an above market rate of return. In order to do that on these high opportunity, high risk investments, they need to have uh, a portfolio of companies. They know that of these 15 to 25 companies, about half of them are going to lose all of the investment or maybe return just the original capital. And only a small percentage of those companies, maybe 10%, will be the really big returns, 10 times their money or even more. And it's those companies that are going to make the whole portfolio pay back that above market rate of return to their investors. So in order to pull that off, each company has to have the opportunity to grow at 100% a year. So opportunity and risk do go together here. To show you just how much risk goes along with this opportunity, I want to share with you some data from the U.S. venture capital industry. And it shows here that, in fact, uh, maybe the venture capitalists are a little optimistic in their outlook. This is data from 20,000 investments over a long period of time. And as you can see here, the risk of having a loss, zero to just one times your money, is actually 65% and the opportunity to make 10 times your money or more is actually less than 5%. So again, opportunity and risk do go hand in hand, and it's something that the venture capitalists are extremely focused on. It's important to note that it's not just the venture capital-backed companies that have a high risk of failure. In fact, all new businesses have a high probability of failing uh, over a period of time. Here's some data from the U.S. again, showing that despite what year companies get founded, it's remarkably consistent that over time, about half of the companies are out of business by year five, and it's about 60% failure rate by year seven. And I use that just because seven years is kind of the typical uh, exit period for successful investor-backed companies. So investors are first focused on the risk of your business failing for some of the typical reasons that all businesses may fail. So you might ask, what are the normal reasons that startups fail? There's remarkably little substantive research, but there have been a few attempts to answer that question, why do startups fail? So I'm going to share three looks at this question. First is from CB Insights. As you can see, they've got a long list that they derived from interviewing a number of investor-backed companies that shut their doors. You can see the top of the list is no market need for the product. And number two is they ran out of cash. Ran out of cash is kind of a, a typical thing because uh, a lot of businesses run out of cash, kind of like saying that you died because your heart stopped. The question is, why did they run out of cash? I suggest you stop the video for a moment and take a look at this long list before we go on to the next graphic. Here's another list put together by funders and founders. 
18 things that can kill startups. Another list uh, starts with single founder, something you hear a lot about from investors, and all the way down to putting in a half-hearted effort. Again, I suggest you take a moment to stop the video and have a look around at all of these and think which of these common reasons why businesses fail might apply especially to your business. And finally, here's an infographic that's been circulating around the internet. Not quite sure what the source of the data is, but clearly these are intended to show top reasons why investor focused startups fail. Number one reason again is building something that nobody wants all the way down to number 10, ignoring social media. So why don't you take a moment to say which of these might apply especially to your business. So let's return to the task of trying to re-engineer investors' perspective on investment risk in you. So we've established that failure is common and there are lots of reasons why startups fail. So investors are, when they're looking at you as a potential investment, thinking what is the probability that this company will end up as a failure because of some of the common reasons that are true across all sorts of small companies. Secondly, what are the particular kind of risks that apply to your company, your stage, your industry, where you're located? And what is the risk that you're going to be a failed investment because of all of those reasons? And then finally, as you look at the possibility of risks, how they change over time, how can their investment help you to eliminate or at least minimize the failure risks and thus lead to a so-called de-risking of their investment, which in turn increases the value of their investment over time and increases the probability of a great outcome of a 10 times their money on the investment. This perspective on looking at the probability of failure risk for regular reasons and specific reasons and de-risking across the life of a company applies at all stages of your interaction with potential investors. It starts with the screening process where investors are looking at you and saying, okay, so where is this coming from? Who's the referral? How risky is that? Is it over the transom or is it coming from a trusted resource? What's the stage of development? What's the background on the team? And translating those ideas into the risk of failure. And then when they're looking at your company more in depth, after you've had a successful pitch in the due diligence process, they are looking at some very specific risks of failure. So they're asking at a high level, what are the big risks and trying to focus on those specifically to see if they can get comfortable with them. And they want to understand what are the manageable risks, what things can you and a board and investment uh, can, can you manage over time, and then what are perhaps some unmanageable risks, things like uh, the risk of a country totally changing its regulations upon which your business depends. Then as they're looking at the investment and what you're planning to do with it, they're going to try to understand in your use of proceeds, how is that de-risking the business? Are you taking out marketing risk? Are you bringing on more senior management to reduce the management and execution risk? So they're translating the dollars and how you're gonna use them into a risk reduction because risk reduction increases value over time. And then finally, as I'll show in just a little bit, the valuation that they're going to talk with you about of your company, the pre-money valuation is directly tied to their perception of the risks that you have already addressed in your business so far, as well as the risks that you have in front of you. So exactly how do investors tie their perception of risk to the valuation that they want to give you when they're putting in their money. 
Here's one method developed many years ago by a guy named Dave Berkus that's still being taught to angel investors in the US. And he took a relatively simple approach. He looks at four different kinds of investment risk and ties that to the valuation. So what are those risks? First of all, there is development risk. What is the probability that the company at an early stage is actually going to get to the point where the product is fully developed and can be sold to the marketplace? Secondly, execution risk. What is the chance that this early stage management team is going to be able to pull off the strategy that they are talking about? Uh, in this case, uh, sometimes young teams don't have a lot of experience, whereas senior teams have less of an execution risk. Third, what is the marketing risk of the company? This is a big one for a lot of companies. Not only what is the probability that customers are going to like the product, but also can they be attracted, can they be acquired at an affordable cost? And finally, there is investment risk for most companies because most companies require more and more capital over time. So what is the risk that you're going to be able to attract more investors with larger amounts of money at an increasing valuation over time? All of this contributes to these investors' perception of what value they ought to be placing on your company based on their assessment of those risks. And here's another valuation methodology taught to angel investors in the US that uses 12 different risk factors to assess the appropriate valuation for early stage companies. I'm not going to go into details into all 12 of these, but uh, feel free to take a moment to look at all of these and understand that when an investor is looking at your company, they are specifically translating their assessment of the risk in each of these factors into the potential valuation they're going to put on your company. So again, being able to assess your own risk in the eyes of investors is incredibly important in the discussion of the appropriate valuation for your company.